Well, hi there and welcome back to our study. I want to ask you a question. When's the last time you were really, really, really hungry? <laughs> you know, sometimes we use the word starving without even thinking about it. But as we get into these beatitudes that we've been talking about for the past three weeks, we're going to continue now to be looking at one that really should hit home. But it's going to be difficult for us because hunger and thirst is not something that we truly know. But through this verse and through understanding what Jesus meant when he said it, I think we can get really close to the, to, to the meaning of, of what Jesus is talking about here. Yes, I'm talking about Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, which says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. This is a capturing verse. It's something that you and I are going to have to work a little harder on gaining the concept because, let's face it, in our world today, hunger and thirst for us personally most likely is not something that we truly know. So for us to appreciate this blessing, let's face facts. We're going to have to understand a couple things, all right? First of all, we're going to have to understand what hunger meant to that multitude, and we're going to have to understand what thirst meant to that multitude. All right, let's, you, let's take it from the, the top here, and let's take a look at something. Hunger is a word that we use in terms of uncomfortable. We don't truly know what the word hunger really means. Most of us don't. Now, some of you may know that, that word, and, and if that's the case, um, that's good. But for most of us, I think we have to really conceptualize this a little bit more. In other words, what would it be like to truly not have food? It doesn't take long for us to know that not too long ago in our own history, my mom, as a matter of fact, she told me when she was a kid, they didn't have food. She grew up in southeastern Oklahoma uh, back during the Dust Bowl and the Depression. And she said that she would go out in the woods and literally scratch for berries, anything she could to eat. And they just didn't have much. And yet now in our generation, we have trouble closing the refrigerator door because we have so much stuff. Well, that's why it's difficult for us sometimes to get the meaning of what Jesus is talking about here. But let it be known that the people who he was speaking to understood this very well. They knew what true hunger really was. They knew what it was to be thirsty. But Jesus is going to use this concept of physical hunger and physical thirst to get us on track to where we should be spiritually for righteousness sake. So let's take a step back. And again, as I like to do in anything, I'm more of a procedural kind of guy. I like to look at things in steps so that I can go from one step to another in a process to help me get to where I need to be. It's, it's so hard sometimes for someone just to say, do this or be this. Okay, where do I start? <laughs> where do I get to? Well, that's why I like to break things down into processes like I've done so far in these Beatitudes, and we're going to do it again today. The, the, to be able to get to hunger and thirst for righteousness, it's really a threefold process that will, I believe, accomplish what Jesus was trying to get at, not only to them, but also to us a couple thousand years later. What God has always wanted to do for his people since he created us, that's, and that is to really get us to desperately seek and search and scratch after his righteousness. And so let's talk about this first step, shall we? As we get into this, what's the first step in this process? Number one is we must recognize our need for true righteousness. I underline the word true because righteousness is a word that can mean a lot of different things. People consider themselves righteous just because of things they do or places they go or, or even how much they can say or, or do in, in, a, in, a, in a spiritual setting. That's not true righteousness. The true righteousness that Jesus is talking about is what we're talking about today. It's being able to grasp the character and the embodiment of Christ, who he was and, and his mind and his heart. That righteousness that brings to us everything we could ever hope for to be able to have in our lives. So how do we get there? How do we gain this righteousness? Well, first of all, to recognize it, we've got to look at ourselves. We have to realize that our own righteousness is worthless, okay? That's the way it starts. We've got to be able to toss away what we have and look for what God has. Because if we think we can do all this by ourselves, then why do I need Jesus? If I can think like God all the time, why do I need Jesus? If I can... Uh, 
take care of my own sin. Why do I need the Lord? Well, we can't do any of that without Jesus. And that's why in order to recognize God's true righteousness, we have to recognize that our own righteousness is worthless. Where do we go for that? Well, we go to Luke. We go straight to Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Let's see what Jesus said here. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. Why? For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This speaks to the core of, of our reality. What is that? Is that you and I have no righteousness in and of ourselves. The Pharisee tried to claim his own righteousness by at least giving God kudos and saying, thank you that I'm not like these other people. He gave him a little acknowledgement there, but then he quickly started boasting of his own things. Look how righteous I am. Look how I fast. Look how I tithe. And I'm not even like this guy. I'm not a robber. I'm not an evildoer. And I'm certainly not as low as this tax collector. He had everything to say about his own righteousness. And then here comes Jesus. Cutting to the very core of that way of thinking, he goes to this tax collector who would not even look up to heaven, humbly said to the Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. What Jesus' statement was, this man went home justified rather than the other because If we try to exalt ourselves, we will be humbled. That's the key in understanding righteousness. This has nothing to do with what we can do or who we can be. We have no righteousness in and of ourselves. That's the first step to being able to recognize our need for true righteousness. And here's another one. Recognizing that no one is righteous before God. Really? Romans chapter 3 makes this abundantly clear, verses 9 through 12. Paul says, what shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For for we all have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Wow, this is an indictment. Can you imagine if we get to the point where we think we contribute and we have all these righteous things and acts that we do, imagine how this would cut us to the quick to have Jesus tell us through the Apostle Paul That no one is righteous, not even one. To consider the the weight of that indictment is huge because it leaves us absolutely helpless, absolutely with nothing to show. And we got to get to that point before we're going to really seek the, the true righteousness of God. We have to get to the point that we know we don't have it. I don't have it. You don't have it. No one has it. We can't do it by ourselves. We can't even be righteous before God because we have all sinned. We've all fallen short. No one understands. We don't get it. We are just a bunch of sheep wandering around the wilderness without Christ. Once we get there, that's step one. Step one in in hungering and thirsting for righteousness simply means that only in Christ can we find it. (laughs) In Christ only we find true righteousness. That's where it's found. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, Paul made it abundantly clear. He said, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become what? The righteousness of God through Jesus. Because Jesus was righteous, and he was sin-free. But God made him who knew no sin to be the sin for us, 
so that we might then become the righteousness that God wants. So there's the first step. The first step is recognizing that true need for righteousness. First of all, by getting it, that we don't have it by ourselves. We are not righteous. We are sinful. We have nothing to offer God. And then recognizing that it's only found through Jesus Christ. When we get to that point, if you're there, if you can say, okay, I get all that. I, I agree with that. I'm on board. And step one, then we can move on to the next step in this process. And that is this. We must desire it with all our heart. If we can't get it ourselves, then who do we get it from? And how important it is that we get it. That's what Jesus was talking about a little later in the Sermon on the Mount. It must be our first desire. It has to be. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, is, I don't know, a verse that many of us probably have said many times. We've even sung about it. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seeking something first, his righteousness. Oh, you know, this just seems like such a concept, doesn't it? It's a theory. It's something that we know is true, but what are we doing with it? I've always said something that is a theory does no good unless it is practiced. A theory must become practical to be worth anything. If we say that we want to seek God's righteousness above all, then we need to do that. We need to really understand that it, not only is that important, but that's our life's goal is to seek his righteousness. Hunger for it, thirst for it. We've got to desperately need it. And that's why we must be willing to give up everything for it. Oh, man. I'll tell you, I feel like I'm, I'm just swimming in theories right now. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking about myself. I look at this and I'm saying, I get all this. This is so true. But what am I doing daily to do it? Am I where Paul was in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, when he said, but whatever was gained to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. That's it. Paul got it. He understood it. It wasn't just a theory to Paul. Paul literally counted his life as nothing for the sake of finding God's righteousness in Christ. He had a lot of accolades, and he had talked about those prior to that passage we just read. I mean, this was a man who was, who was from the nation of Israel. You know, he was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, as the law of Pharisee, zealous for the church, persecutor. He was everything that he was supposed to be. But when he met Christ in, in Acts chapter 9 on his way to Damascus, then and there it became known to him for the first time in his life he was nothing without Christ. Then he decided, I'm going to give up everything to find this righteousness because my own is nothing. Man, that's the theory that needs to be practical for us. And it's hard. I get it. I'm not just sitting here throwing this out like it's a piece of cake. It's not easy. But it means that everything we do, we got to pray for this. we got to be in step with the Holy Spirit because that's what the Spirit wants to do, folks. He wants to show us what true righteousness is. And it isn't found typically in what we consider the favor spots. It's not found in this world. It's not found in, in all these places where we can brag about our accomplishments. It's found in Jesus Christ. And that's why the second part of the process after we come to the conclusion that we need God righteousness and my righteousness is nothing, then we have to desire it with all our hearts. And that's why with Paul saying that, he helps us understand that, you know what? I'm going to have to give up everything that I think is important in order to put God's righteousness in that place. And now we go to step three. Step three in this process is we must pursue righteousness as a starving man pursues food. <laughs> this is where Jesus is talking about. When he used that concept to those people, when he said, hunger and thirst for righteousness, 
he was hitting at their core because there were a lot of people in his audience that did not know where their next meal was coming from. And some of them, as we know, followed Jesus because he could create bread out of nothing, out of just a couple of pieces of bread. He could feed thousands of people. There were people in the crowd who were following him simply because he could provide for them physically. But he turns the corner here and he says, this isn't about physical. This is about spiritual because everything on this earth is going to, die, is going to waste away. Nothing is going to last physically on this earth. But spiritual righteousness will last for eternity. And that's why we have to get this concept. Pray for it. Ask the Spirit to show us. Because the blessing is to fully pursue righteousness, okay? Not fully attain it. Now, you might say, that sounds like the cat chasing the tail, okay? Why am I going to go after something I can't get? Why would I do that? That's a good question. But here's what I need us to understand. I know that Jesus was pointing in this direction, is that righteousness is, is something we're going to pursue every day of our lives. We are never going to fully get there. That's why he compared it to hunger and thirst. Because when you hunger, you get food just a little while, guess what happens? You get hungry again. You're thirsty. You drink some water. Guess what? In a little bit of time, you're going to be thirsty again. He compared it physically to the same thing. We need to pursue righteousness the same way that we pursue food and drink. We don't eat one day and say, okay, that's it. I'm good. All right. Thank you. That was a good steak and potato. I'm good. I won't need to eat again the rest of my life. Well, you'd be a fool to say that. No one's going to say that. You're already going to start planning your next meal, right? If you're like me, you're going to think, okay, where do I go next? Well, Paul, the, the, the point here, what Paul was saying in Philippians is that this is something we give up every day for. We search for it. We seek for it because it's found in ways that we would not normally think. So we are constantly filled with God's righteousness as a man is constantly filled with food and water. That's the concept is that every day we're seeking from God to teach us, to show us, to help us obtain his righteousness. Because only through Jesus is where it's found. And Paul understood that. And he, he imagined every day in the life of Paul. And we might think, well, I don't know if I'd want to do that or not. Because let's face it, every day that Paul went out, he never knew who was going to persecute him. He didn't know what struggles were in front of him. But he did know this, that God was going to teach him through any and every situation that he found himself, the righteousness of Christ. And through that, through his faith in that, he would eventually get closer to God. You and I are on that same trajectory. We are aiming every day to get closer to Christ, to get closer to his righteousness, to understand it more and to fill us up with it, but never fully attain it. So what have we learned today? This process that we're talking about. Just like last week when we talked about blessed are the meek, it's a process we constantly need to be engaged in. Well, the same is true here. Number one, we must recognize the need for true righteousness. That's number one. Number two, we must desire it with all our heart. It needs to be number one. Number three, we must pursue righteousness as a starving man pursues food. That's why Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why? For they will be filled. I want to conclude today by saying this. Many people, a lot of people, try to fill themselves with different things to make them feel complete. Relationships, substances, pride, accomplishments, work, money, all of these things and more fill us up, but it's useless because that's not what our hearts were ever intended to be filled with. That's why people find out when you get on, when you, when you drink alcohol, when you take drugs, when you go down this road of pornography, as you go down this road of whatever it is that we're going down, it ends in nothing. It's like a dead end street. Every one of them end in failure, disappointment, guilt, shame, and sometimes tragedy and even death. Why? Because our bodies, our hearts, were never meant to be filled with that. What our hearts were always meant to be filled with since the day God created us was what? The righteousness of God. 
That is what really fills us, gives us purpose, gives us meaning, fills us with grace, fills us with peace, fills us with the joy that every man and woman that's ever been created seeks is the identity and the righteousness and the love of God. That's why Jesus said, hunger and thirst for it. Let it be your number one desire. Because if that's what truly we are seeking, God will give it to us. And he will fill us up with it because that's what we were created for. So as we go from this with this lesson in our hearts, please join with me in seeking that. And again, we're not going to be perfect at it. How many times do I need to say that? We're going to stumble and fall at times and we're going to find ourselves sidetracked. We are human beings and we have this flesh that we're struggling with every day. But the Spirit wants to become more and more the focus of our lives. And the righteousness of Christ is what we need to hunger and thirst for every day that we live. And we will be blessed because of that. Because no one will touch that joy that God will give us through that blessing. So let's take this, let's pray about it, and let's see where God leads us on the path of righteousness, his righteousness, not our own, okay? Now next week, we'll be right back at it. Beatitudes continue. Can't wait for next week. Please come back, and God bless you. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. We'll see you next week.